Welcome to the Spine Guy. I'm Dr. Brian Sue, a fellowship trained spine surgeon in Marin, California. The Spine Guy is a channel dedicated to making the complex spine simple for patients to understand. Today we'll be talking about the surgery that Tiger Woods had for degenerative disc disease. It's called an anterior lumbar interbody fusion. And since Tiger Woods just crushed it in the masters, this video is particularly timely. I'll be posting new videos weekly, so hit the subscribe button to catch them as they come out. Just as a review, degenerative disc disease is when the disc between the bones start to degenerate, lose fluid, collapse, and the bones start to rub on each other. Once we diagnose the degenerative disc disease with a functional anesthetic discogram, and again, that's inject injecting the disc with numbing medicine to make certain that pain goes away so we know that that disc is the problem, the basis of treatment is to remove the disc in entirety and either fuse the spine, meaning attaching this bone to that bone, or putting a disc replacement in. A disc replacement is essentially a metal on plastic mobile device that is placed into the disc. Disc replacements have been around for over 20 years in the lumbar spine. They started in the lumbar spine before the neck. Over time, lumbar disc replacements have somewhat fallen out of favor mostly because the mechanics in the lumbar spine are such that there's quite a bit of load placed on it and the outcomes of total disc replacement to fusion have largely been somewhat similar. So today I'm not going to be talking about lumbar disc replacement. I'm going to be talking about this anterior lumbar inner body fusion or an ALIF and that is the Tiger Woods surgery. So let's talk about the surgery and what the surgery is done for. So again, back, buttock, belly. Here's the side of the spine. This is the L5 bone, the S1 bone. There's the L5 S1 disc, and here's a disc here. And you can see that these are normal discs. This one is actually a little bit dark, but not terrible. This one really abnormal, complete loss of disc height. And this is the modic change I'm talking about. This is called the STIR MRI image, STIR. And you see there's so much degeneration in the disc that there's actually ballooning or bruising of the bone itself. This actually indicates that if you take that disc out, uh, the patient will do relatively well. Here's an X-ray and a CT. An X-ray shows the bones. So back, buttock, belly, L4, L5, S1. And because it's X-ray, the bones show up as white. The clear spaces are the discs. This is the L5, S1 disc, and you can really see the disc height collapse there. And Here's a CT. A CT scan is kind of a combination of an MRI and X-ray. A CT scan does have radiation, but a CT scan shows us the bony anatomy. So here you see the L3-4 disc. It shows up as dark on CT. The bone shows up as white. There's a normal disc. And there you really see how flat that disc is. Um, and you can see even some what's called sclerosis, which is the bony end plates changing because there's so much pressure on the disc. So again, the surgery we're talking about is the Tiger Woods surgery, which is the ALIF, anterior lumbar inner body fusion. So an incision is made, if the belly is here, an incision is made over the abdomen. And once we're to the front of the spine, we completely take the disc out. And after we take the disc out, you can't leave the disc space empty. So we put a plastic cage in filled with a bone growing substance and typically we'll put screws through the cage to help keep it in place biomechanically so that the bone can grow through and through in between the cage. Every time I tell patients I'm going to make an incision in the front of the abdomen, they totally freak out and they say, oh my God, you're going to go through my intestines, through my stomach. And what patients don't realize is that we do what's called a retroperitoneal approach and an anterior lumbar interbody fusion is probably one of the most minimally invasive surgeries that I do. And that's because there's basically no muscle cutting at all and the dissection is very elegant. It's one of my favorite surgeries because I think it's so not invasive. So we don't go through the intestines or through the stomach. In fact, we go around everything. Here's a great picture of what that looks like. This is the view of the spine and this is kind of at the foot of the bed looking from bottom up. And so an incision is made in the skin over the abdomen here, and we go around everything and retract everything to the side to reach the disc. So in fact, we're not going through this, 
we're going around it. And again, it's called the retroperitoneal approach. This approach in my practice and in many practices is done with the help of a vascular surgeon or a general surgeon because there are some blood vessels in the way that have to be negotiated. The chance of blood vessel injury is exceedingly rare. Um, and if it happens, the vascular surgeon is there to repair the blood vessel. Again, once I'm to the front of the disc, I completely remove the disc and place a cage with screws. So I do have some props because I thought you'd like to see what these cages actually look like. So this is the cage. It's a plastic cage. The plastic cage has holes in it, as you can see. And what we put in these holes is typically bone graft. Many surgeons, including myself, use something called BMP, bone morphogenic protein. BMP was actually on the news many years ago because there were some suspicion that BMP had a slightly increased cancer risk at very high doses. There's some data that suggests it might. However, at the dose we use it at for spinal surgery, it really has not been shown to be carcinogenic. And BMP is one of the strongest bone growing substances we have. Um, and I think the benefits far outweigh the risks. BMP comes in a little white sponge and we take that white sponge and we basically stuff it into these little rings here. And once the disc is taken out, we take this cage and we introduce it into where the disc used to be. Now again, something has to hold this cage in place so that bone can grow through and through the cage. And that's usually with screws. So these are what the screws look like. They look like fancy screws from Home Depot. But these screws go through the cage and up into the bone. And we put cages, we put screws up and then we put screws down. So it looks like this. There's a good look of an A-lift cage. This A-lift cage happens to be made by Stryker, which is a, a spine implant company. There's hundreds of implants out there. They're essentially all the same, and it really has to do with surgeon comfortability. So again, disc comes out, cage with BMP goes in, screws go up and down, and the plastic cage ends up sitting there. Actually have a really nice acrylic model here to show what it looks like. So here it is. This cage essentially went in here and the screw goes up and the screw goes down and that's what it looks like. This gold plate here is essentially a, a buttress plate and it looks like this little guy and it's placed over it to prevent the screws from backing out. Use of BMP, use of the hardware leads to almost a 99% fusion rate. Um, and in fact, I've, I think I've only seen one of these cages fail in 10 years of practice uh, from an ALIF. So risks of surgery, definitely there are some blood vessels in the front. We talked about that. The cage has to go in the right spot. We use x-ray guidance, neurological monitoring. Um, our experience, despite our best efforts, if the cage or one of the screws is irritating a nerve, we have to come back to revise the hardware. The chance something like that happens is less than 1% in 10 years have not been back once to have to repair hardware, knock on wood, uh, in the lumbar spine. There is a risk of infection. The anterior lumbar spine is very vascular. I mean, there's lots of blood vessels, so the chance of infection is very low. And there's a particular risk in men that I have to talk about, and it's also it's always a little bit strange to talk about, it's something called retrograde ejaculation. So when we do the approach for this, in the front of the lumbar spine, there's these little spidery nerves in the front. These nerves uh, control ejaculation. So if you're a male and you're having an anterior lumbar interbody fusion in the front of the spine, Injury to these nerves can cause retrograde ejaculation, which essentially means you can have an erection, you can have an orgasm, but there's no ejaculate. So if you're a 16 year old guy or you're a 25 year old guy, or even if you're a older gentleman that wants to have kids, you wouldn't be able to have kids if you got retrograde ejaculation. Again, chance of retrograde ejaculation is rare, anywhere from three to 6%. 
Uh, there is some data to suggest that use of BMP may increase that risk, so you may talk to the surgeon about that. But if you're a male who's having an anterior lumbar fusion who wants to have more kids, you would donate sperm to a sperm bank, see if you got the retrograde ejaculation. If you didn't, then you wouldn't have to pay for that because you would still be able to ejaculate. Otherwise, you would use the sperm from the sperm bank. So long-term risks of the surgery, one is not fusing. We already talked about there's a very, very low chance of not fusing. And the biggest risk of any fusion is something called adjacent level disease. So there's no question by taking a little bit of the motion out of L5S1, the spine translates load to the level above, which is typically L4, L5 for an L5S1 fusion. Many of my patients ask me what the incision looks like, how big the incision is, um, here's one of my male patients, here's one of my female patients. Obviously, patients with a bigger belly will end up with a bigger incision. This incision is about uh, four inches long. We do this, what's called a minimally invasive, mini open type approach, so it's not a huge incision. There's the belly button, and the incision typically starts at the midline, and in my technique, we kind of go oblique here. Uh, here's a female, and we'll actually put a quarter next to here, so you can see a quarter is about an inch. So this incision is about three, three and a half inches. And lastly, I'll show you what the x-ray looks like after the implant goes in. So this is the side view. In this case, the belly is over here. Back is over here. Here you see the cage. The cage is plastic and has markers in it. So I showed you the cage before. So this is the cage on its side like this and the markers in the cage are implanted in the cage and they show up as these little lines so this is the back of the cage there's the front of the cage and then you see the screws going up and down so the idea is this holds stability the bmp is in here and this is going to fill through and through to fuse here it is on the front back view and this is a really nicely paced cage and it's center center here you can see the marker on the right and left of the cage and there's a one screw going to l5 these are the two screws that are kind of superimposed over the cage going into S1. The biggest thing patients ask me about having an anterior lumbar fusion or any fusion is, am I going to be stiff and not be able to move? The reality is there are so many other segments in the spine that allow you to move that fusing L5S1 actually doesn't take any motion away because the other levels picked the slack, hence the rate of adjacent level disease. This is a great operation when done in the right patient. You can see it worked for Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods ultimately had to have an anterior lumbar fusion because he had many discectomies in the back that weren't helpful. Um, that also reminds me that sometimes, and we talked about this on the last episode, when the disc is very degenerative and the bones come closer together, the nerve gets pinched because the bone is pinching it up down. With this surgery, you get what's called indirect decompression, meaning when you put this large cage in to where the disc used to be flat, it indirectly lifts L5 off of S1 because of the spacer and it creates nerve within the foramen. So this surgery is actually quite good for people that have also nerve pain from up-down collapse. I would argue that it's better for patients who have some nerve pain associated with their back pain. From a post-operative standpoint, Patients are usually in the hospital 23 hours, um, which is just overnight, sometimes two days. Obviously there's abdominal pain just from the incision, sometimes there's back pain. I have my patients wear a lumbar corset for six weeks, which is a very soft brace, just to help them get up and walk around. Typically for the first three days, patients are more in bed than out just because of the abdominal incision, but they are up around and walking, typically on narcotics for about five to seven days. I have my nurse do a wound check, uh, meaning look at their incision. Their patients are usually walking independently into the office at five days. At six weeks, most patients are walking one to two miles uh, in a day. I start physical therapy, core strengthening at eight weeks. Usually by three to four months, I start patients back at the gym. Just because we put the, I'll use this model, just because we put the cage in and the screws in doesn't mean that the bones fused. Bony fusion is a biological process that, that takes 6 to 12 months. So typically if I have a patient that's a golfer or a division 1 athlete, I usually don't let them back to full impact activity until 6 months post-op because that's really when the bone is solid. 
Once the bone is solid, the hardware is not doing anything, the cage isn't doing anything because the bone is grown through and through and there's really no purpose for the hardware and this is essentially rock, rock solid. So again, full bony fusion is six to 12 months, even though patients are actually feeling pretty good from this surgery after six weeks. So the anterior lumbar fusion is a great operation in the right patient with the right preoperative uh, studies and that includes weight loss, six months of non-operative care, single level disease, bony end plate changes, and most importantly, a good outcome from a functional anesthetic discogram. And it works for Tiger Woods, then it could work for you. Thanks for watching this episode. Don't forget to click the like button and leave questions or feedback in the comment box below. And feel free to let me know what videos you would like to see in the future.